Good morning. Welcome to Calvary. So this morning, Pastor Charlie is out of town. He is on a camping trip. So continue to pray for him and Denise. Actually, Denise is on the women's retreat. That's why a lot of the ladies are missing this morning. We have a women's retreat this weekend. And so they're all up there. They've been up there since Friday, having a good time. And they'll be coming back this afternoon. So prayers would be appreciated for that, for safety as they come back. Um, as far as announcements today, um, I don't really have anything new going on in the church, so just your typical Bible studies we have throughout the week. All that information is available online at the website. We do have a new website up and running, so I encourage you guys to go check that out. It's really easy to navigate through all that. And then also, we are still under construction, as you can see, so the lyrics aren't up yet. We're in the process of getting these TVs mounted to the walls and um, getting the lyrics up for you. In the coming weeks, hopefully, we are going to have um, a worship tab on our website as well where you guys can go and access lyrics um, and as well as actual videos of the songs that we're going to be doing for each week so you guys can check those out in advance. But let's all stand together. We'll open up in prayer and then we will worship the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you just for the opportunity to worship you, to gather together with the saints and and just lift your name up, Lord. We ask that as we sing to you this morning that we would be encouraged and built up, but ultimately that you'd be glorified and that our praise would just be a sweet aroma to you. And Lord, we do ask that you would come down and meet us here this morning. Pray that you'd just fill our hearts and, and fill this building with just your presence, Lord, and we would be aware of it. Lord, we give this time to you. We ask that you'd bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Cause we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet We shout out your praise Shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause He hung upon the cross and He rose up from the grave. My God, still rolling stones away. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, shout out your praise. Cause we are the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We were forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's sing, there's joy in the house. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Cause we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet We shout out your praise 
shout out your praise. Let's sing, there's joy in the house. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Because we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Amen. Lord, we worship you this morning. We pray that as we continue to worship you, Lord, that you would just continue to fall down. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give this this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to worship, feel free to stand or sit, just however you feel led to worship. I count on one thing, the same God who never fails. He won't fail me now. He won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails. He won't fail me now. He won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names. There's nothing can stand against. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will. Bless your name, oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my day. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. 
Jesus, are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Let's bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I sing, oh, what a Savior. So what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. And bow down before him, and for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen, so no word a Savior, and isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, and bow down before him. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing that again. You give life. 
Cause you give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. your breath cause it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Lord. Let's pray. sing all the earth as all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord as all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, because it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. Pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Sing great are you, Lord, Lord, as great are you, Lord. Sing, it's your breath, because it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Sing great are you, Lord. Lord. Great are you, Lord. Amen. Lord, great are you. Lord, we worship you in this place this morning. Lord, we thank you for your presence here. Lord, we pray that, just as we sang, Lord, that all of us would understand that it is your breath in our lungs. The very fact that we are alive and breathing this morning is because of you, Lord. And so we desire to give it back to you. We desire to give our hearts, our lives, everything back to you. Lord, we ask for wisdom and guidance and life when the things that just come up on a daily basis lord we pray that we would seek out your spirit and just seek out your word for guidance we pray that we would be a church that just diligently seeks you seeks your word seeks you in prayer lord we thank you for your presence here we pray that as we get into your word that you would speak to us that you would give us understanding of the text and we'd be able to apply to our lives and be changed 
Lord, we love you. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Check one, two. We are on. I got the thumbs up from the back. <laughs> so I see some of the ladies are back from the retreat already. You made it down from the mountain. I know that my wife's on her way back. I'm excited about that. It's kind of hard being a stay-at-home dad, huh, Dustin? Hi. This morning, he brought his two kids. Uh, he's got three, but he brought two of his daughters. And I was like, hey, so has you, do you guys like your dad's cooking? And Peyton looks at me, and she's like, I was like, and then Dustin's like, whatever, we had some burrows for lunch yesterday. She's like, yeah, but you didn't make breakfast this morning. Aww. I know. Can't wait to tell, tell Laura that. But my son, so I feel like I'm a mean dad. Like, my son's 12 years old, and he's never had Filibertos before. So yesterday, I know, I heard a, uh, I know, I felt bad too, like when I was thinking about it. But I got him his first breakfast burrito yesterday, and he was like, this is the best thing ever, Dad. I'm like, yeah. And then for dinner, I got him Taco Bell, and he's never had Taco He's 12 years old, never had Taco Bell. And he loved that, too. I got him two chalupas, and yeah. He was, he was kind of making fun of the sauce, though. He's like, this Diablo sauce ain't nothing. Like, he's like, Mom's salsa and hot sauce is way hotter, Dad. I'm like, yeah, it's true. It's a good flavor, though. <laughs> My daughters, they think uh, talk, Taco Bell's for chumps, and I'm like, dude, get out of here. <laughs> but no, the ladies are coming back. I know the, the Lord's been doing a work in them. I'm excited to hear about it. Um, Henry, I can see that your facial hair has grown more since your wife was gone. <laughs> Seriously, in your hair. <laughs> Man, the first service, my notes kept slipping off. The pulpit here. So, yeah, the big TV here. Um, our projector broke the contraption that uh, brings down the screen. And the bid that we had for it was about $4,000. $4, so just to be transparent with you guys, like, we, we just kind of want to move away from the screen anyways because it blocked the cross. We kind of like, like it, you know? And so we want to, you know, just show it more. And, and we thought that we'd get these TVs. We got them at Costco. Not that I work for Costco, but... We got them for Costco, and we're going to put them on the sides here. And it's on a stand right now because my buddy Jason, when she's not in here right now, I think he's teaching, isn't he? I think he's teaching one of the kids, the kids class maybe, for Noah. I'm like looking at his wife. She's like, I don't know. <laughs> no, there he is right there, Jason. Jason's teaching on Wednesday night. I definitely encourage you guys to come out if you can. That's him if you don't know, who he, if you don't know what he looks like. But Jason's going to be teaching through the book of First John, Second and Third John on Wednesday nights for the next month or so. And he, wants, he was like asking if we could get something to do PowerPoint instead of the white sheet, um, <laughs> which wasn't too bad last week. Definitely felt bad. So that's, that is an announcement. This coming Wednesday, uh, Jason will be start first John, 6.30 p.m. Tonight is the first Sunday night of the month, so we will do prayer, share, and communion if that is something that you would like to be a part of. It's a good time if you've never been a part of that. Uh, last week we had Indo partners, uh, some missionaries from Indonesia, and just want to encourage you guys that uh, through you guys' even financial support, you know, we were able to support them. And so uh, just continue to pray for Kurt and Jeff. And then my brother-in-law, Jordan's still here, and my sister, she's at the retreat coming back with my wife. The Fakers, they're missionary, missionaries over in the Basque country, and we want to continue to pray for them as well. So let's pray now and see how far we get. Maybe we could drag this out long enough. My wife will be back by the time I'm done. All right, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you once again for this morning, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, as the ladies uh, at the retreat, Lord, were touched by you and and uh, received your word and just a fellowship with one another, God. I pray that that would just continue on at church and actually beyond these walls, Lord. Help us to be just like authentic Christians, Lord, that, you know, that we're not just checking boxes, not just going through the motions, Lord, but truly just in awe and love of you, love of you Lord. And just, uh, I thank you for the worship, Lord, as we were just singing to you, Lord. It just can't wait, Lord, to be in your presence face to face one day and just, you know, just enjoying that, Lord. And 
just long for that, Lord. But in the meantime, Lord, we just want to know how to live life. And, 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 and as we navigate through it, Lord, we need your help. And you said you wouldn't leave us helpless, but you'd give us your spirit. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, if you could please speak to us in Matthew 26. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So Matthew chapter 26. We haven't been here for two weeks in Matthew because we had Easter Sunday two weeks ago. And then last week we had our missionary friends come and share with us. But I do find it interesting that in 2020, October 4th, I started the book of Matthew. And it's been two years. Kind of scares me. Maybe I should pick up the pace. But... In the season of resurrection and Easter, it just so happens that where we're at, Matthew 26, 27, and 28, is going to be more about the death and resurrection of Jesus. So hopefully you're not worn out like, with hearing about Jesus being alive because that's what we're leading up to again. And I honestly think that you're probably not because that's the pinnacle of our, pinnacle of our faith is that Jesus is risen. So Matthew chapter 26, verse 1, reading from the New King James, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be sacrificed. So it, it definitely came to pass where Jesus, when he was done teaching, uh, done with what sayings? Well, Matthew 24 and chapter 25, contextually, we know that Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. And when they were, before they got to the Mount of Olives, Jesus was telling the disciples, you know, you look at all these, you know, look at the temple built by Herod, you know, look at these ornate buildings. They're going to be torn down. Not one stone's going to be left upon another. And they were intrigued by that. They're like, what are you talking about? You know, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus began to unpack and teach them that in the future, that the temple that took Herod 46 years to build, it was all coming down. That was a shocker to them to hear that. I mean, it's not just the buildings, it's everything that goes on with that too, the religious institution up there on the temple, sacrifice and the priests, all that, Jesus says is gonna come to an end. And they wanted to know more about it. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus said many things. He said a lot of sayings, a lot of teachings. They begin to ask Jesus, you know, tell us about the future. Tell us about when you're coming back again, the signs of the times and, and the coming of the age. And Jesus began to teach him about the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, and how the whole world is going to be turned upside down by the gospel and people will be persecuted. You will be persecuted, Jesus said to the disciples for his name's sake, but that that gospel would continue to go forth in the future. So Jesus had a lot of sayings. Matthew 26, again, it says, after Jesus had finished all these sayings, then he tells them, you guys, in two days it's Passover, and I'm going to be delivered up and crucified. You know, as I pray and ponder about a message, you know, the message for this Sunday morning, you know, I couldn't help but to think that I can be like the disciples a lot where, I, you know, my head's in the clouds almost kind of like, I, I just want to know the future. I just want to know what's ahead of me. I get so far ahead of me sometimes. And I, and I feel like what we read here in verse 1 and 2 is that Jesus redirecting, you know, yes, the future is going to happen and, and, and I'm going to come back again. I'm going to rule and reign. But, you know, here, we're in the here and now. And the here and now is very important. I'm about to be delivered up. I'm about to go to the cross. And that's vital for our future. Jesus is saying, if I'm not crucified, if I don't go to the cross and die for the sins of many, then there is no relationship with me in that future. So let's not miss what God has in the here and now. And so when the Lord is speaking to me that personally, I'm just like, man, I've been, I get caught up. Just like my wife being gone and my four kids, I'm left behind with my four kids. Like that's a bad thing. But, um, but you know, my kids are old now. I got two 18-year-olds. Um, a 19-year-old and an 18-year-old. I got two adults now. Yeah, me and my wife do. And there was times when they were younger, like Dustin's kids, where I couldn't wait for them to grow up. <laughs> I wasn't enjoying the moments per se. So definitely enjoy little Henry, you know? Like that's, I'm, I'm like that old guy now that's, that's saying the same things the old guys told me to enjoy my kids when they were growing up. Like when Titus was little, like Declan, Declan's so cute, Declan's so cute, my brother-in-law's, uh, son, he loves balls. 
Declan does. And I mean, he's picking them up and chucking them around my house. And my son did the same thing. And, and I was like, man, I just want him to grow up so we can actually play catch. I, I mean, I looked forward to that moment where he'd be older. And I would think about that a lot and almost kind of miss the here and now. And now my son's old enough where we play catch, but I know I'm starting to have those feelings now like, man, unless this dude goes pro, we ain't going to be playing catch very much after this. Right? So I guess what Jesus, to me personally, as I was praying and pondering this, just verse 1 and 2, is like the disciples, I can get ahead of myself just thinking about futuristic things all the time, but missing out the importance of the here and now and what God is doing. Don't miss out in this text right here. Jesus says, look, guys, I'm about to die that's very important. It's very vital for our relationship with him. I'm trying to learn in my life to, to somehow embrace the process of life. Like I think about the construction in this building. It's not going under the timetable that I want it, <laughs> right? But me and Dustin, we're talking that in the future, we believe that we're going to look back and be like, you know, there were some very important moments during that construction period that God taught us some things. And so we're trying to learn how to embrace the here and now, what God is wanting to do now. And so let us not forget that. The disciples, just like all of us, they were just so amped hearing when Jesus would come back again. And look, I think we're all like that. Like we can't wait for Jesus to come back, the rapture of the church, him coming back and ruling from Jerusalem. But what had to happen first was Christ going to the cross and dying for us, dying for our sins as the sacrifice. And yes, verse two there, way, you know, this is beautifully written. You know, even an unbeliever, I believe, should approach this text with a lot of respect from the author's standpoint of view. There's 66 books in this Bible, Genesis to Revelation. And the book of Exodus, which there are extra, so, so, so there's archaeological evidence. It's called the Septuagint in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found manuscripts of Genesis and Exodus and Isaiah that are dated 200 years before Jesus was ever even alive. And so within these writings, we have stories about Passover. And we know that we have, you know, this stuff was written about 4,000 years ago. But the Jewish people, I know that you guys know this, but Jews celebrated a Passover once a year. It was annual. They were commanded to do so because it was one of the greatest events that ever took place in their history as a people. They were bondage. They were slaves to Egypt for over 400 years. And they cried out for a savior. They just wanted freedom. They, men, women, and children, they just wanted freedom to worship their God and live in their own country with freedom. And God raised up Moses. And through the plagues of Egypt, God provided a Passover lamb that if he took that lamb on the 14th day of Nisan and put that blood on the doorposts of your house, the angel of death would pass over and you'd be saved. And the next morning they got up and they left. Well, it's just so beautifully written here by the author because the same week of Passover, Jesus says the Son of Man is going to die. He's going to die. Beautifully written. There's a connection there that the author is revealing to us. I mean, yes, Matthew's the author. I believe the Holy Spirit's the author like you guys do. But the author here is letting us know that there is a link between Old Testament Passover and Jesus' death on the cross during Passover. Paul the Apostle, who would be radically changed from a Pharisee a Christian killer into a, a Christian spreading the gospel. We love the Apostle Paul. He would actually write to the church at Corinth that Christ is our Passover lamb. He is our Passover lamb. That in him we have salvation. Moses was raised up to save and deliver the children of Israel. Well, Jesus is being raised up to save us from our sins. He's our Passover. I mean, it's just beautifully written that it's during this week that all the Jews, whether it's from the far country of Israel and the city of Dan. Dan was the farthest city in Israel. Or maybe the southernest city in Judah. If you were a Jewish person in Israel, once a year, you're to come to Jerusalem and celebrate this. And Jesus says, it's that day I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I mean, it's very sobering, right? They're all amped up talking about the last days. And Jesus says, guys, pump the brakes. I've got to die first. I've got to redeem you guys. You know, for us to have a future, I must be crucified. So meanwhile, verse 3, the chief priests, scribes, elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. 
So it's almost like if you're watching a movie, you know, the, the movie like pans from Jesus revealing again to the disciples that he's going to die. It's like the camera like switches over to a different scene where almost like behind the scenes you have these religious leaders getting together at Caiaphas, the high priest's house, palace, and they're like plotting and planning, like, how do we trick Jesus? Like, how do we, how do we get him, man? We're sick of him. We're sick of him, man. Like, we got to destroy him. For these religious leaders to be moved to murder Jesus reveals to us as readers of this story that they were extremely bothered and felt threatened by Jesus. I mean, it was this week that Jesus overturned the tables on the temple. Jesus was sick and tired of religion. He was sick and tired of people just checking the box, whether that was a priest or the, whether that was you and I just going up to the temple, right? We weren't there 2,000 years ago, but if people were just going up, checking the box, like, okay, I'm good this year for Passover week, and then I can go back to my home and live, live any way I want. Well, Jesus was done with religion and was us- ushering in the new covenant through himself about relationship, and this really upset the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And so they began to plot and plan, like, how do we, how do we trick Jesus? How do we trap him? I think this is so horribly just wrong, obviously. I mean, you can't contrast Jesus, have a starker contrast between Jesus, a rabbi, the son of God, than these religious leaders of his day. Jesus is presenting that he's going to die for the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. This is God in human flesh that's willing to save humanity through himself. He's so selfless. Here, Jesus just got done teaching in his sayings that he's going to judge, that he is the judge. But he is about to be judged for mankind's sins, even though he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve my sin or yours. And he was judged. These religious leaders, they're not concerned about spiritual things. How do I know that? It sounds pretty bold for me to say that. I can boldly say that these spiritual leaders, these chief priests, scribes, elders of the people, high priests, weren't concerned about spiritual things because this week is Passover week. This is a week that most you know, priests get to finally see some of those families they haven't seen for a year. Broken families. I'm sure that within this last year, uh, in the text here, uh, that there was homes that had children that might have gotten a disease and, and passed away. Or people's land, they've had to mortgage their land and, and sell it because financial trouble. You know, I'm sure there's many people that pour into Jerusalem during this time that are going through great times and are having prosperity. But this week, above all other weeks, Passover week, was a time for these ministry leaders to actually minister, to come alongside, to love, to pray for, to give wisdom and insight, to teach Torah to the Jewish people. But instead of being spiritually minded and ministering, they're like in the back room over here at Caiaphas' house, how do we kill Jesus? It breaks your heart. It had to be done according to God's will so that mankind could be saved through Jesus but you couldn't have a starker contrast between a good leader, a good example in Jesus, and bad ones. It breaks my heart just because, like, so many religious institutions today, I feel like we don't, you know, emulate Jesus. Jesus was just so selfless. Sometimes it's hard to discern God's will in our lives. It is. Is this from God or is it not? You know, obviously a lot of prayer has to go into determining God's will in our lives and reading his word. There's a verse in John chapter 10, verse 10, a lot of us know. I believe it's a good barometer to find out what is God's will. Because honestly, what the, the Pharisees are doing in this chapter, trying to plot and trick Jesus and kill him, that's not godly. That's not from God. But how do we know that? In John 10:10 10, 10, it says the thief, Jesus said these words, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know, Jesus had earlier on in his ministry told these same Pharisees and religious leaders that your father's the devil. John chapter 8. And that that riled them up. That fired those guys up. Like, are you kidding me? They began to argue with Jesus. But, you know, they emulated the devil because the devil does come to steal, kill, and destroy, disrupt, try to hinder what God is doing. That's what Satan does. 
He tries to distract. Satan has fallen from God's presence. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. Those are the chapters that, re that is revealed to us. Revelation chapter 12. Those chapters are the ones that reveal to us Satan falling from grace. And it's ever since then, when he fell, that his mission, his goal, is to drag as many people to hell with him uh, before, you know, he's permanently there. And so the stealing, killing, and destroying of people, that's definitely, I believe, satanic. But Jesus, he comes to bring life and life more abundantly. And, you know, he puts a stamp on that by saying that the good shepherd actually lays down his life for the sheep. So determining God's will and, and what's from God and what's not, I can confidently say what the chief priest scribes, Pharisees, the high priest here is not godly. It's actually the will of Satan to do this, not, you know, God. Now God wanted Jesus to go to the cross, but to be treated, man, there's just no regard for spiritual things, the spiritual Passover feast. They're just worried about an uproar, which by the way, no spoiler alert, an uproar takes place anyways. It takes place. You know, it's not many days from here that the people are going to get together and say, crucify, crucify Jesus. Jesus is going to go before Pilate. He's going to go before Herod. He went before Pilate again in the Sanhedrin. It's going to be a huge commotion. You know, and I, I do think it's the way that the Lord wanted. But these people here, they should have been interceding for these people coming in Jerusalem, but they weren't. I'm nervous. Like, I, I want our church, right? Like, this church, you know, we're not a perfect church, right? Like, there's no... The, the church of God, like, the true church of God is the Holy Spirit indwelling believers, right? So that's worldwide. And so that church is, is spotless. It's perfect, according to the Bible. But when I say imperfect church, you know, like, just church organizations... And, you know, our heart and prayers here at Calvary Chapel Apache Junction and our heart and prayers for other churches too is that we would be a church that would actually, you know, intercede and minister and love people and bring them to Jesus and not be concerned in the background on how to tear people down and, and tear down the work of God. We want to be a part of the Lord's work, not working against it. It's unfortunate because a lot of re religious institutions are a lot like these chief priests and scribes and it breaks your heart. Now, in verse 6, there is a changing from a scene again, back to Jesus. So if we're in that movie and we're watching almost like The Chosen, I guess, <laughs> which they haven't got to this section yet, but probably going to be a few years. They're only in season 3. But verse 6 here, Jesus goes to Bethany. So let's read it, verse 6. When Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. She poured it on his head, and he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. They were, just, they were upset. They were ticked off, saying, um, sorry, that's my translation, but they were just very upset, saying, why this waste? Verse 9, for this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have, or always have. Yeah, I am not always. Okay, verse by verse here. <laughs> for she has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as memorial to her. I wrote in my Bible, it's 2022 and it's still going. That's pretty cool. And we had missionaries last week. I know it's the fakers, those are my brother-in-laws, who the church supports, our missionaries in the Basque country. It's their heart to share that gospel into the whole world. The, the Lord has led them there. And we're thankful for that. And we're thankful for Kurt and Jeff that are in Indonesia and also stay here. And, and others, there's, you know, there's many people that are called to be missionaries, missionaries over the last two millennia to go out and share this gospel. And Jesus said, wherever they go and read my word, this story that we just read, which we're going to dissect a little bit, he says, they're going to talk about her. They're going to read about her. And, and it's because it's important to, to examine what she did. So here we are at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Now, Simon the leper, the reason why he's distinguished that way 
You know, it's because there's a lot of Simons in the Bible. It was a popular name. You had Simon Peter, the disciple. We're very familiar with him. We have Simon the Zealot. Maybe you're familiar with that guy. We have Simon, Simon of Cyrene. He's the one who carried the cross of Jesus. And we also have Simon the Pharisee in Luke chapter 7, which was also a separate event where Jesus was anointed by a woman with oil in that chapter. So what we're going to read here about this woman anointing Jesus actually takes place in all four Gospels, and it led the earliest commentary in church history, Origen, to think that there was three anointings of Jesus with oil by ladies, but modern-day scholars, pastors, teachers, believe that there was only two separate events recorded in the Bible where Jesus was anointed with oil. I know that you guys care about the facts, right? Like, but, you know, let's be honest. The Bible wasn't able to contain everything that Jesus did 24 and 7. John refers to that, that I guess the whole world wouldn't be able to contain all the books. All the books in the whole world wouldn't be able to contain everything that Jesus did. So let's be honest, there could have been other times too that Jesus was anointed um, in his lifetime. But it looks like there's two that's recorded. Matthew, Mark, and John record this event that we're reading. But let's not skip over Simon the leper. I really focused, focused in on that um, as I was studying and preparing, uh, praying over this text, that I think it's pretty neat to look at the heart of our Master, our Savior, that he was able to fellowship at a person's house that used to have leprosy. Uh, some people question, was he still a leper because it says Simon the leper, but most likely no, because according to the law, Leviticus 13:46. As long as they have the leprosy's disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. So Jewish law, God's law, was not to live in close quarters with the infectious, diseased person. So it looks like most people agree. I'm, I'm one of them that believes that Simon, somewhere in the ministry of Jesus, was touched by him, physically and spiritually. Jesus made the unclean clean. He's the clean that can touch the unclean and still be clean. If you and I touched the unclean back then, we would be unclean. But Jesus being God could do that. He could save him from his physical infectious disease. But more importantly, he came to a spiritual understanding of his salvation through Jesus. And where Jesus showed the hospitality to Simon, Simon the leper is now showing hospitality to Jesus and others in his house. And that's what happens as Jesus impacts us. Man, we just want to serve him. And that's what Mary, I believe that's who it is, who's anointing Jesus. You just want to give your life back to the Lord. So Simon the leper used to be leprosis, a leprosis disease where he was an outcast of society, a reject. He was broken. I don't know what was worse, the infectious disease or having to live alone outside the camp. You know, you know, it must have been heart-wrenching and breaking during Passover because in his past during this week, he wasn't able to just walk into the city and enjoy all the festivities with close quarters of people. He couldn't do that. He'd have to watch from afar. And that had to hurt, honestly. It's not good for man to be alone. God said that in the book of Genesis. It's not good for man to be alone. And Jesus reached him and touched him and, and embraced him and, and still fellowships with him. It teaches me as a follower of Jesus that I must have the same kind of love towards my neighbor. I need to have it because I don't have it naturally, but I need to love what we might consider the outcasts, rejects, you know, maybe the ones that are alone. We need to reach out to them and love them as well. That's what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? Well, that's what he did. He reached out to the lepers. He reached out to the tax collectors. He called them and used them and, and hung out with them. It is important to bring out, though, that Simon the leper most likely, again, is not a leper anymore. And I was thinking about this devotional because I'm supposed to be teaching verse by verse right now. Um, but I'm from Washington State, and, in, and I moved here 20 years ago. And when I go back and visit, some of my high school friends, they know me as Chris the baseball player. I mean, I wasn't that good. I mean, I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but that's what they know me for. I was, I was decent in junior high in high school, and that's what they know me, Chris the baseball player. Or, you know, some of my friends, they know me as Chris the jerk. You know, Chris, you know, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's one of those, that guy's, I don't even want to go into it. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I think we're online, so I don't need to, but uh, I am labeled a certain way to, certain, to some people. But I, I, I know, though, that I'm not that guy no more, though. 
So other people can, you know, still call me what they remember me as. Simon the leper, they can call me Chris, fill in the blank. But, you know, Christ has redeemed me. And by his grace, you know, I'm his child. You're his child if you've received the Lord. And he doesn't view us the way that we used to live in our sin. He sees us whole and clean. And I think it's important to know. I'm sure that Jesus got a lot of flack for hanging out at Simon's house. Now we're going to pause here and turn to John chapter 12, because John 12 fills more gaps in for us. It's the same story with extremely more detail. John chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Pause. <laughs> what? Matthew chapter 26 said, Disciples, you know in two days is Passover. It looks like a discrepancy. What's going on? John's account says six days before Passover. Matthew said two days. Here's how we solve this. When we put the Gospels together... When Jesus came in to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, he came in on Sunday, the triumphal entry. Well, we know that John and Luke's account, by, and I'm not a scholar, right? I just, I'm a pastor who reads the scholars and I have to use the Holy Spirit to discern, you know, what does seem correct, right? But John and Luke, for my own study myself, is, is more chronological written in order, where Matthew and Mark, not so much. They're a little more sporadic in their recording. They're more like me, dude, when I, when I journal. And when I'm journaling, I try to journal every day. And like, I, I, I try to be specific. 5, a, 5 a.m., I wake up, have coffee with my wife. And, I'm, and that's what I do. 6 o'clock, I get at the church. 6.30, devotion. 7 o'clock. I try to be detailed because I want my kids someday to just see my life. But there's times when I'm recording my life, I'm like, oh, snap. I forgot. That happened yesterday. I didn't record that, so I just write it down. On the, and so, you know, you could say that my events in my journal are not necessarily chronological order all the time, because my mind, I'm not that. Some of, some of us, some of you in this room can be very like John and Luke, where you can write things down chronologically really well. Well, we know that John's account, by revealing to us that this, this event that takes place in Bethany, the anointing, it happened on Monday, which that means in our text in Matthew chapter 26, that when Jesus was teaching about the Mount of Ol on the Mount of Olives about the end times, and then he redirects their attention to his death on the cross, that the anointing actually took place before that, and that Matthew just recorded it after <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 24. Kind of confusing, but in my mind, I've reconciled it. It's not that big a, deal, big a deal to me. I get it. But that's majoring on the minor and minoring on the majors here. I'm not going to get caught up on that. Six days before the Passover, so Monday, Sunday, Monday, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who was, who, sorry, where Lazarus was, who, was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil, spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with that fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was, what was put into it. I know, what a, what a bum. But Jesus said, I don't want to be like Judas. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So more insight. Look, they're at Simon the leper's house, but one of the reasons why they're going to the house is to have a dinner with Lazarus. Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. Great story. Mary and Mar Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, awesome, wonderful story. They were, they were broken when their brother died, and they were going to Jesus like, please, like, if you were just here, you wouldn't have died. And Jesus was like, oh, just wait. And he raised him back up to life. 
And we know that in the other gospel accounts that on the, on, the, on the triumphal entry when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey on Sunday that the Pharisees were so annoyed because so many people were praising Jesus but they were equally annoyed according to the gospels because Lazarus was there with Jesus in the triumphal entry and people were gathering around to just to even see Lazarus because they had heard the news they had raised. So the flow of the context makes sense. They come in on the triumphal entry, it's Monday, and they're having dinner in Bethany, commemorating, hanging out with Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Simon opened up his house for this event to take place. So there's other people there, Mary and Martha. Martha, we always see her, wonderful lady. We have the women's retreat this weekend. And here Martha is just, again, continually just serving Jesus. And you have Lazarus, Lazarus there hanging out on the table with Jesus. And then we have Mary. This is the woman that's spoken of in Matthew 26 that we read about. That This is the story that will be shared throughout all of eternity, wherever this gospel goes. She takes a, a pound of very costly oil, and she begins to, according to Matthew 26, pour it on his head. And then she uses her hair in John chapter 12 to begin to wipe Jesus' feet and, and, and anoint him with this great fragrance of oil. Amazing, amazing story. I'm gonna read something that I, that I pulled from a website. Alabaster was a stone commonly found in Israel. It was one of the precious stones used in the decoration of Solomon's temple. These alabaster boxes or jars, and so in this case, most scholars believe it was a jar with a long neck that had to be broken, but it was an alabaster box or jar that would be filled with an expensive perfume or oil now, again, the scholars, I'm not a scholar, but the scholars say that at this time that these oils would be imported from India and they were super expensive. Obviously, Judas knows the price. We could probably get like 300 denarii for it. That's not $300. Today, actually, you can go to like on the online and look at the denarius and look at the exchange rate for US dollar. I think it was like wallinvestors.com. That's where I went. But I went to a lot of websites just to check myself. And give or take, right, 300 denarius in today's money is $120,000. That's how much it is. So more things perspective. 2,000 years ago, the denarii, if you worked a whole day, you get one denarii. So easy math, that you work a whole year, you're going to have a little over 300, about 360, give or take, uh, denarius. What she gave was a whole year's worth of salary when she did this. So pretty amazing that, that she did that. So it was kept in these alabaster jars and what she gave was very costly. And so there's just more details there. So let's turn back to Matthew 26 and finish this, finish this section. Matthew 26. At the same time, the Pharisees and scribes, and they did this for a while, it wasn't just this week, planning, plotting to kill Jesus, we have saved individuals like Simon, Martha, Mary, Lazarus in this room in Bethany that are just blessed, blessing and worshiping Jesus. She gave all that she had, and she was called out for it. It's embarrassing. You know, you know she's giving all that, this expensive, costly oil. She, she broke it. She's given it to Jesus. She has a pure heart, according to Jesus. She's genuine. It's authentic love that she has for her master. Simon the leper has been touched by Jesus. Well, Mary's been touched by Jesus as well. And she just wants to give back. She wants to give something that's worth so much value to give to the invaluable person, Jesus. It's amazing, but she gets called out. Verse 8 of Matthew chapter 26, I think, is the dumbest words I've ever heard anyone say in my life. Why this waste? Those got to be some of the you know, most dumbest words anyone could ever say in regarding Jesus. We know here in verse 8 it says, when his disciples saw it, they were upset, saying, well, we know John says Judas led the charge. Judas is the one that incited that conversation. What are we doing here? This is a waste. Why waste this on Jesus? Holier than thou. We call that oversaved <laughs> at Bible college. We could just give this to the, we could give this to the poor. Jesus isn't worth this. Like what the heck? Jesus, you'd want us to give this to the poor, right? You don't want this costly oil. He's like, leave her alone. She's not doing a wrong thing. She's loving on me. 
What are you doing, Judas? We're going to read more about him next week. It, it bothers me because I want to be more like Mary. I don't want to be like Judas. Later on, Judas sells out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know how much that's worth? 200 bucks. 200 bucks. We'll talk about it next week. In Exodus, if you had a servant and he was gored to death, you owed that guy 30 pieces of silver. That's how much a servant cost was 30, 30 pieces of silver, 200 bucks. Not much. Not, not, servants weren't valued very much. You know, Jesus is the king of kings. Kings got anointed in the Old Testament. King David got anointed with oil. King Saul got anointed with oil. Jesus is king of kings. She did the rightful thing. She anointed her master, her savior. She gave all that she had. You know, a lot of these ladies would save this oil for very special moments in their life, whether that be their wedding, even for burial themselves. It meant a lot. It costed a lot. But she just wanted to give something to Jesus genuinely, and she gets called out for it. That's, that's dumb. That's why I say it's the dumbest words you could ever say. Why this waste? Jesus rebukes them, rebukes all of them. They said the wrong things. Jesus says, you have the poor always. They're always going to be here. Jesus isn't saying, neglect the poor. No, he's just saying, look, she's doing the right thing. I'm God. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm God, and I'm not going to always just be here in the flesh like I am now. I'm about to die. I'm about to rise from the grave. I'm about to go be with my father. What she's doing is a good thing. And wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, I want people to know about this. It got me thinking because Jesus wants us to think about this story. You know, what do I give Jesus? Do I even want to give anything to him? So I began to think by myself, does he want my Xbox? No, that's dumb. <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> what, is, what do you want from me, Lord? And I just want to encourage you because if you're, if you're a believer, you've already given the most costly thing you could ever give them, and that's your life. You know, I think about, I'm going to get a little theological here, and I know within the Christian church, uh, the, the wider Christian church globally, when it comes to election and free will, we, we have disagreements. Um, I'm persuaded that God is sovereign and man has free will. And I believe that when God created mankind, he created us free agents to do what we want to do. That's a good God. He didn't force us. I don't believe he forces anyone to relationship with him, that he created mankind and said, I want relationship with my creation, but I, but I want them to want to have a relationship with me. And I get that. I'm married. I don't want my wife feeling like she has to be with me. Like I want to have true, genuine love in my own life. I don't want it to be forced. And so in this free agency, I believe governed by God and the laws of mankind, for the most part, we can do what we want to do. If I don't like Washington State, I can come to Arizona. Ain't no one stopping me. I mean, shoot, if you really want to get down to it, we could spend a long time we can pretty much do what we want to do, go where we want to go, and even if that means sin. You know, when there's consequences to our sin, we might land ourselves in jail, but God allows us to, in our free agency, to do what we want to do. And I do think that there's nothing more blessing God, like this pouring out of oil, this costly oil that she gives. I believe there's nothing more costly than, a, than, 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 than anything that you and I could give. It's just saying, you know what? I don't want my free agency. I don't really want to do my will, even though I have the freedom to do what I want, that I can do what I want to do. God, I lay that down at your feet as she washed Jesus' feet. I lay down my whole free agency and say, Lord, I just want you. I give you my life. Do what you, do what you want. Take me where you want to go. I was in Washington State. He took me to Arizona. Took me to California first, met my wife there, moved to Arizona, made me a pastor. I'm like, what the heck? I just wanted to be a baseball player. That didn't work out. I wanted to be a police officer. That didn't work out. I wanted to be in the military. It didn't work out. But, you know, when I was 18 years old, 1999, I, I can really feel and identify with Mary here because I just wanted to give Jesus my life. I didn't know what that meant. It's the most costly thing that I have is my free agency. And I was like, Lord, I just want whatever you want. And I feel like you guys could probably agree with me. That's the way you feel too. 
That's the most costly thing to deny yourself and say, I want you, God, and whatever that means, it's what it means. You know, my daughter just got back from Bible college, and it's, it's blessing as a father that, that she's, she could, my, my daughter could literally do whatever she wants to do, especially in this country. She can do whatever she wants to do, but she chose to go seek God out. That blesses me because that means that her life is costly, and she's like, you know, I want to have what the Lord has for me. Man, I don't know if you've made that decision this morning, but there's nothing greater that you can give God than your life to him. She did it. She deserves to be read, this story. It's valuable. What Judas gave was nothing. Judas was the opposite of this. He was like, I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I don't think he's worth that much. And so I'm going to get what I can get now, and that's 300 bucks. That guy felt guilty, killed himself, committed suicide. We'll get to the questions, was Judas saved? What is going on with Judas? We'll get to that next week, probably the next two weeks. Jesus is actually going to make a statement that it, was better, it would have been better if Judas was never born. He'll make that statement. But, you know, it caused me to think as I read through this verse by verse, I'm sharing it with you guys, you know, where am I at in this story? Am I Mary or am I Judas? <laughs> and I think a lot of us, we're definitely Mary, you know? We've given our lives to him. And I want to close with this verse in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul the Apostle, talk about a guy who was radically changed. He went from a Pharisee, Christian killer. He was a murderer. Let's not forget that Paul the Apostle was a murderer. He dragged men, women, and kids into jail. But Christ radically changed his life. People were freaked out about Paul the Apostle. Christians were like, I don't think so. They were leery with hanging out with Paul. I get it. But his past doesn't dictate who he was in Christ or what Christ would do through him in the future. Paul would go on in the first century to be the greatest missionary this world has ever seen. He established churches all throughout minor Asia and to some of these churches like Ephesus in chapter 5, of the Ephesians, he says, Be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smell and aroma. Sometimes I read the Bible and I, and I don't put myself in the context when Paul writes. Paul says that what smells good to God, what's, what's a great fragrance of, of, of oil, so to speak, like what we're reading about in Matthew 26, is loving people the way that God loved us. And, and it means a lot when you read Paul because Paul was a murderer. I mean, Paul wrote that stuff. Paul said, God wants us to mimic him. We need to love people. Obviously, we don't, we don't die on crosses Jesus is the only one that could die on the cross, but we need to have that same selfless love for people. That smells good to God, Paul says. And for him to say that, I bet you Paul's an emotional guy. We read that stuff sometimes, we just read right over it, we're like, cool, I'll get a tattoo, I'll put that on my, I'll put that on my bumper. That meant a lot for Paul when he said that. He used to be a killer, and now he's saying we need to be lovers. Paul also said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing. But to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. I laugh because I still work in the real world. Not that this isn't the real world, but I still do fire alarm systems. And often I hang out with superintendents and unsaved people, construction workers, and, you know, they can say the craziest of things, you know. I'm not going to go over it online. But, you know, it's kind of disturbing sometimes. And so you kind of name drop that you're a Christian. Sometimes you just start talking about your wife when these other guys are checking out ladies and talking about sinful stuff. I direct it back to my family, wholesome things. And I can just tell it ticks them off. It's like the aroma of death. Like, stop talking about that. You know, like, I was really upset one time when, nope, can't go there, we're online, can't talk about it. But to get the picture, like, I've been in work environments 
where I've had to, you know, to witness, you know, verbally witness for Jesus because I've been so bothered sometimes about the junk that's being shared. And I'm like, I feel like the Holy Spirit told me, like, I feel like it, that like, you know, these unbelievers are so bold and dropping F-bombs and talking about the most craziest things. I felt like the Lord was like, why don't you be just as bold? Start name dropping me. <laughs> I was like, okay. And I started doing that and then people get quiet. They start getting on their cell phones. They just don't want to pay attention. It's the aroma of death. But the fragrance of Christ to those that are being saved, man, it's awesome. Like here at this place and other churches, like when we're sharing and we're talking about Jesus and we're fellowshipping and worshiping God, man, it's a beautiful spiritual aroma. We love it. We love it. When you meet someone in the airport, you're out there working somewhere and you meet another Christian, man, it just smells good. Like it feels like you've known that person for a while. It's a great fragrance when we live for Jesus. And so what's costly for our life is just giving them our heart. You know, that's, the, that's the costly ointment that we could give to him, nothing else. That's what we give first and foremost is our lives to him. Jesus said, Matthew 26, she did a great work. She didn't waste anything. Man, they should have been ashamed of that. And I, and I do. I think that Judas later on was ashamed of the way that he behaved. You're always going to have the poor. You're not going to always have me. She didn't realize it, but in verse 12, he says, she's pouring this out for my body. She did this for my burial. Again, Jesus talking about his death that he's about to undergo. And wherever this gospel's preached, this woman's story would be told. And so here we are, 2022, May 1st of 2022, still going through it. And if the Lord tarries, guess what? I guarantee you, I'm not a prophet, but I guarantee you that if, we're, if, hum, if mankind's still around in 100 years, that story will still continue to be taught. And Christians will still glean spiritual truth from that story about how we should give our lives to Jesus as she did, as she followed him. It's just pretty amazing to think. Have you done that? Have you given your life to Christ? <laughs> that's just that's between you and God. You know, Judas, he was definitely a pretender. He fooled the disciples. Judas, de he deceived. The, the disciples were completely caught off guard. It wasn't until after Jesus rose from the dead that they were enlightened with the truth that Judas, who was with him the whole time, actually didn't believe. We can fool others, but we can't fool God. How does God view you if you are Judas? Well, in John, Jesus washed Judas' feet. He still loved him. He still cared for him. It still broke his heart. So Jesus loves the saved and the unsaved and desires relationship with us. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this morning, God. I thank you that we have the ability to, to read Matthew 26, John chapter 12. Thank you for the story of Mary, Lord, and just her giving her all, Lord, to you. Thank you, Lord, that, you know, that we can give our lives to you, Lord. Thank you that my heart belongs to you. Our heart belongs to you. God, I said it 20 years ago, but I'll say it again and again, and, and I think, you know, the people with me would agree, Lord, that we give you our, our lives continually day by day. Lord, we desire to pick up our crosses daily and follow you. We give our will to you. What do you want us to do, God? We just want to serve you. I think of Isaiah, Lord, where he says, here I am, send me. Where do you want me to go? I pray that for all of us, Lord, that we would just surrender ourselves to you. Whatever you do, you do. <laughs> just give us the strength to overcome. Fill us with your spirit, God. We need your help. We love you, God. We care for you. We bless you, God. You are holy. You are worthy. You're the one true God. As Mary acknowledged, we acknowledge you are the King of Kings. We're so excited for your return. Lord, help us to share you with others in the meantime. We love you, God. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good day. If you need prayer, myself, some of the elders, we're definitely available.